Hello, welcome back to another episode of the Investor Financing Podcast. And I was a little nervous with the guest today because I was reading her background and I was a little intimidating. Like, okay, what questions am I going to ask? Uh, we have such a, a real estate powerhouse um, that, that not only is very successful in real estate, but also just reading her background, I got chills. Just like, it's, it's a pers- uh, she's a person that really cares about everybody and it's not about selling properties and growing this massive company but really giving back to society and i think we need more people in the world that actually care about their their employees or their independent contractors compare about uh care about their clients so please welcome Bess friedman to the show she's the ceo of brown harris stevens which has 50 plus offices over 2300 agents is like one of the largest privately owned real estate brokerages out there. They have offices in New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, Florida, all the good places. And as soon as I started to talk to to Bess uh, before the show, I'm I'm from the East Coast, so I just love hearing the accent. I love hearing East, there's nothing like an East Coast accent. And something about East Coasters that I miss here living on the West Coast, although we're getting some some East Coasters here to the Las Vegas area. But um, really honored to have you on the show to talk about real estate in general uh right before we went live we were kind of diving into the fact that the media loves a good story the media loves to talk about the negatives and and of course i think our market's been just nuts right we had covid and and new york was hit hardest during covid um and then everything came bouncing back in like in the last in the last 12 months i think you know nationally the average home uh appreciated and got $64,000 of equity. I was reading that. So we had 18, 20% run up in like 12 months. And this bull run has been the longest bull run, I think, in history. And so today, you know, I I think now we're seeing signs of slowdown. We have rates that have doubled. Uh, We have all this inflation. And now people are worried. And I think the media is just kind of scaring people away. But I think this needed to happen. And I think what's going to happen is it's going to open up the doors for the first time home buyers again, which they've been sitting on the sidelines. So I think it's going to actually, we might feel a little pain, but we're going to feel it's going to roll into some positive where people that weren't able to get in the housing market are going to be able to. So I, I think I'm excited for that and I'm excited to, to have you on the show. So thanks for joining us. Thank you, Bo, for having me. It's my honor. And thanks for the really kind words. Really makes me feel like a million bucks or a billion bucks, I should say. <laughs> so you, you had your... Uh, you, you started your career in, in law, um, and I, I'm just curious on why real estate? Why did you transition into real estate? Yeah, I, I get that question a lot. Um, people would think, you know, you went to law school, you passed the bar. Why the heck would you trade that in for real estate? I wasn't planning to. I had always wanted to be a lawyer since I was a little kid. Um, it's just something I wanted to be a voice for people. And I felt law would give me that opportunity. And I did that as a prosecutor and as a legal aid lawyer. But then I had a baby um, and or and I was supposed to go back to work at legal aid. And I didn't want to I wanted to spend more time. So a friend just said, you would be great at real estate. You're smart. You dress the part. You're you know, you have all the pieces. Give it a try. So uh, I did. And I was I loved it because it was entrepreneurial, like you could go in, make your own hours, do your own thing and really uh, do a great job just by showing up and being capable. So I transitioned 20 years ago into real estate from law. But I will tell you this, Bo, that getting a law degree, the tools that you get from that and actually working as a lawyer, I was in court, which was fantastic is incredible. Those tools have served me well, even to this day in how you communicate, everything that you do um, and working things out, negotiating. So, um, but it led me to the path of real estate, which I absolutely, I love. It's fantastic. I love that. I, uh, growing up, I never, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was a terrible student. And uh, I was like, I'm either going to be in law enforcement or real estate. And I ended up luckily not going into law enforcement, although we, I thank you all the law enforcement out there because we need you. But I got into real estate at a very early age. I didn't go to college. Um, but later in life, this is kind of an interesting story. I some for some reason, I got really into uh, mediation and doing community mediation. I, I don't know why I just went down the rabbit hole. and I, 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 pay, I, I volunteered and I paid for this uh, program where we, they trained you on how to mediate like community problems. 
And, uh, and I really enjoyed mediation because it's really, it's, it's a skill that you learn how to be like an active listener and how to facilitate conversations. And I use that today when I'm negotiating loans or, or real estate transactions. So such a, I mean, law is, is so valuable. I mean, it's like having that background just gives you such a competitive edge because in real estate, there's a very low um, barrier of entry, right? And a lot of people can just take a test and get into real estate. Now, a lot of people don't. Excel in real estate, it's the whole 80-20 rule, right? There's going to be 80% 80, 80 of the people that kind of fail, maybe do onesie, twosie transactions. 20% of those people are making a living. And then out of that 20%, 20% of those 20% are the actually really successful people doing a million dollars a year in gross commissions or better. That's right. So, so That's I mean, right. it's, it's just a rule of numbers. Um, but but one story here that I wanted to roll into. So I always got really into mediation. And then I saw that... Um, I lit, was living in the Bay Area, uh, and, and Solano County had this um, proctium where Pepperdine University was hosting this really advanced mediation course, and it, they were like d almost giving it away for free. So I signed up, and I went, <laughs> and I get into this room, and no joke, it's me and uh, 20, 25 attorneys. And so you talk about being intimidated, but anyways, I went through this whole training with all these attorneys, and I thought it was the coolest thing because I was like, you know... <laughs> <laughs> attorneys are people too like if you're not in law you always kind of like we have this kind of thing in the back of our, our mind about attorneys but actually what what attorneys do is extremely valuable anyways that was kind of my law experience but the mediation i know the little bit about law i know help help me in my real estate business so i mean i could only imagine so you got That's into, so valuable yeah. Bo. i was just going to say the mediation piece is so good because it teaches you how to work and navigate through people's emotions and needs and it's important you can't just scream your way to a result you have to sort of you know it's the way how you move through it in mediation i think everybody should take a mediation class you were so smart to do that i love it i'm, I'm actually i haven't done it in like 10 years uh i got to do some small claims court cases and that was really exciting so I'm thinking about doing another uh, refresher course at UNLV here in Las Vegas. They have a, a, a course on it again. I think it's just it just adds skill sets. And I think uh, what I what I like about the, the the real estate agents I know. I'm a California real estate broker. I'm a Nevada salesperson. Um, I've been in real estate for 20 plus years. Um, I now focus on the lending side, but I still do transactions once in a while. I represent myself when I acquire properties and and family members and so forth. I like to stay in the game and actually I'm doing my continuing education and it's just interesting taking your ethics classes and all this stuff on because there's a big difference between a good agent and a bad agent I mean like and I'm not just talking about dollar amount I'm just talking about ethics in this in this industry of course. And, of course. and and so a lot of people are always their their first thought is the commission right the, the money involved but really you know I think when the times are good everybody's just thinking money 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 and nobody ever thinks about like the downside of like what can happen if you're not representing correctly because 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 really it's it's a very legal business and people don't understand that that it's a low barrier to entry but you got to understand and then we have conflicts like dual agency and this and all these things that are happening in real estate so my question that i'm rolling into is with all these transitions what do you what are you seeing over the next maybe five or ten years in, in real estate do you think there's going to be a difference in the way the brokerage business is done I mean, I, I think like you just pointed out that there's a difference between the good agents and the bad agents and the agents that are focusing on just money and the end result are the ones that don't do as well. I think the ones that focus on their clients needs and what they want and serving them the best in good faith are the ones that are uber successful. And I think that agents are becoming even more valuable. I know people there's been a lot of talk about technology replacing agents, but I absolutely I don't see that happening, particularly in nuanced markets like New York City, because remember, real estate, unless you're an investor and you're buying a whole slew to flip them, real estate is an emotional commodity and people want to talk to you. They want your expertise. They can't you're not going to go online and buy a house without. Talk, I don't I mean, I think the majority of people need to know more. They need to talk to somebody. They need to see the space. And so I think that that's not going to change. I think technology will get better and empower us to be quicker um, and we'll get new tools. But I think the age or agent is always a huge factor in the success of real estate. Always. Hi, this is Bo Eckstein, host of the Investor Financing Podcast. Are you a real estate investor with properties and you're trying to figure out how to refinance or grow your existing real estate business? 
Need some clarity and a game plan for moving forward? I'm offering a free strategy call where we dive deep on your real estate investing goals. I'll help you come up with a strategic finance plan that will help you get to where you want to go. Whether you've got a portfolio of 30 properties or you're starting out with your first property, I have a framework that has helped many investors grow. If you're interested, book a call below in the Calendly link. Can you, can you walk us back so you got into real estate uh, i'm sure you're you're definitely a go-getter you know just <laughs> telling you your background your law degree uh all the stuff you've done and then you get into real estate and it's exciting for you i'm sure and then and then you find out it's a little bit harder than you thought closing deals and then you built some traction obviously you're probably doing what most agents do you know networking pounding the pavement making phone calls how did the progression happen for you? What What do you think really set you apart in the real estate business that that made you excel? I mean, it's it's uh, you know, I think all good agents are the ones, like you said, who put their head down, pound the pavement, don't look for their own personal accolades, but try to figure. out, It's like the hustle. I always call it the hustle muscle. You got to get. You have to focus on it. You have to pour everything into it. And I did that. I mean, I called Fizbo's. I remember I got two listings from calling this one guy. I mean, I was all, I mean, I, I didn't give up. It's that sort of relentlessness. Um, and so I did that, stayed focused, and I didn't focus on the end result of commission. Although, yes, you want to pay bills. I focused on trying to do a good job, always being on time. I think people undersell punctuality. To me, like that, to me, is one of the most important qualities in a person is people who show up on time and show up as professionals. So I did all of those things. And I just, um, I seem to be the person that a lot of the agents would go to for advice. And so they, they asked me at my other firm that I was at if I wanted to be in a leadership role because they thought I was good at that. And I said, you know, I'll give it a, I, you know, after six or seven years as an agent, I thought I'd give it a try, you know, and I loved it. And so I just kind of put my head down and never thought about a title. I just thought about doing a job and creating and building and being there and showing and I just did that. And I think when you do that, it's kind of like the success comes. And so I think for everybody, whatever you're doing, I mean, you could be a teacher, you could be a janitor, a cab driver. I think it's like focusing, having like respect for what you do. It doesn't have to be like a highfalutin title. I think you can have honor and respect in whatever job you have. And I think I've always been able to do that. And I'm really, um, I feel very privileged to be where I am right now. Uh why were you why were you so driven did you come did you grow up in a in a in a wealthy family a middle class lower middle class family no my my folks neither of them went to college uh very like middle lower class uh grew up in upstate new york in troy uh my dad was scrap dealer let him rest in peace i lost him in a car accident almost 30 years ago um and my parents were just like my mom was home taking care of us my dad went out to work very public school, all that stuff. I just always, you know, what's weird is that I always believed in myself. I never doubted that I could, I always thought I could do anything because my parents were always like, you can do it. And I always believed, I was like, nothing's stopping me. And I always just had that belief in myself. And I do think, Bo, the world will see you how you see yourself, 100%. If you are like shaky or you're doubting yourself or whatever, it comes across. It's how you carry yourself. And I always believed in my own abilities. I'm not the smartest person at all, but I know the smart people. I know where my weaknesses are and I know to work with the people that complement the things that I don't do well, because I don't do a lot of stuff well, but I do do some things well and I, and I focus on those. That's, that's such good advice. I think we, we, all, we all shoot ourselves in the foot because we're, we, we, we have self-doubt and that, that little thing in the back of our brain right. Is, is holding most people back. Like, I feel that way sometimes. I have a lot of very successful friends and, and I sometimes I look over and I go, how did this person in five years time <laughs> just leapfrog over me, right? How did this person, and, and you see that in real estate too, you see like these life, lifetime real, real, real estate professionals and you know they make a living, but then you see this new hungry person that doesn't, doesn't know what they don't know, but has the drive and determination and they go out and sell 50 houses their first year. But is that, is that, is that, are you talking about success purely based on economics? Because I think that that's another thing that our society does. It's a complete injustice. I would rather be happy in a little shit car 
with my friends and family than in a limo with a bunch of jerks that I don't trust. And it doesn't matter. I want people that are going to take the bus with me. That's who I want to hang out with. That That's a great point. Because sometimes I catch myself comparing myself to my friends that are making more money or their network. Don't more. do that. You I shouldn't know, do that. Uh, it's Bo, terrible. You got a happy <laughs> life. You got a beautiful wife. You have this life that you love. You're doing what you love. It's as simple as that. And people are always like, oh, I want to get this. I want... All that stuff means nothing because nobody's getting out of here alive. It's really about the quality of your relationships with people you care about, period, and, and some good food. If you can hang out with people, have some good food, you got it. You're done. That's all you need. That's life. That, you know, you're just pointing out, since, and who knew we would go this direction, but you're making a very good point. And people that are going to watch us here or listen to this in the future, it's so important just to take a breath and just be happy, be grateful. And I need to do a better job of being grateful and and i gotta stop and think you just point this out i wasn't thinking we we're gonna go here with this conversation but it's you're you're so right it's like just be happy you know and and don't compare yourself to other people who cares if who cares if you're the janitor if you're the happiest janitor in the world listen and, comparisons are odious whenever you can always look over and see somebody doing better or this or that but it's all like i will never measure myself through the eyes of the joyless. You know, people who are negative or angry or just thinking about money. I care about people I respect, I want their respect. And so I think it's, we kind of got to shift our narrative. And I think we also need to start to make our teachers, our nurses, our heroes, as opposed to like, you know, so the reality TV stuff. I mean, I think we've got some work to do in our country culturally. I think we got a lot of we got a lot of beautiful things, but we have a lot of things we need to come together more as people and be less divided left and right and more in the middle. because that's where the love is, I think. I agree with you 100 percent. It feels like over the last couple of years, it's been like the worst I've ever seen. And I don't have any children yet. Um, and it, and it, I, I always it always worries me like the society <laughs> seems more jaded now than ever before. Yeah. Uh, but I think you got to overlook that. You got to be able to look at the good stuff. You got to see. And, th and that's what you're doing. Like in your spare time, you probably don't have much spare time, but you give back to society in so many different ways. I'm just reading some of the things that you, oh, you give back to. It's just amazing, though. I think that's that's great that to be well-rounded, not, not only be successful, but be, to be well-rounded and to, to enjoy giving back and, and to, um, uh, I was, don't you yeah. think, Bo, don't you think that anybody who has a platform in any platform, it can be a little one, a big one. Anytime you have a, a loudspeaker and even if it's not for maybe a hundred people, maybe a hundred thousand, you have to do something that helps other people. You can't just be about, look at me. I'm cute. How great I am. Look at my big car. I have so much money. Who cares? help other people when you have a platform you can do so much to you know change somebody's life you know and i think everybody who has a platform has that obligation to kind of do that i and i think a lot of people do do that i just think um we could use a little bit more of it <laughs> you know just a little bit more and, and kind of rolling off this i imagine that your success really came back from this philosophy that you have right like you're a go-giver and so that has helped you to get to be, you know, oversee 2,300 agents because people want a leader that is fair, that is understanding, that's compassionate, right? That's what people want in a leader. People don't want a leader that's, you know, uh, opinionated and, and judgmental and all that stuff. And like, I think as a leader, you're, you're, what, you, what you're doing is, is dead on. Um, can you talk you, a little Bob. bit about, you're welcome. Can you talk a little bit about Brown Harris Stevens? Um, yeah. So they, they never had a CEO to, to 19 or to 2018, right? Yeah, I mean, it, Brown Harris Stevens. So it's been around for 150 years. It's a legacy company, kind of like, you know, I don't know, a Louis Vuitton and Hermes. It's been high end, you know, luxury. That's what it was known for. And when I joined, I was doing business development. That was 10 years ago. Um, and the company kind of operated in silos, you know, Florida, the Hamptons, New York. And Hall Wilkie oversaw just New York and each person oversaw their divisions. But as I came in, I was supporting all the other regions and building and doing and recruiting. And so the owners, the chairman came to me and wanted me to kind of at some point after I showed up the right way and did what I needed to do, offered me the position of CEO. Um, and so they've never had a CEO in their history. And now we are one unified. We're actually almost 3000 agents, 53 offices. Ooh. 
and um, we're growing and adding more. Uh, we just opened a new office in Rhinebeck, New York. Uh, and we're, we're like, we are one company with one mission to help people to sell real estate at the highest level. And it's, it's you know, it's, it's this company, it's nice because it's private. I don't have to worry about shareholders. I don't have to, I can, we do what we want at the table. Like we sit around with all the executives. I have an incredible team of people and we make decisions there. And that's what's really nice about being privately owned. And, and your agents have uh, like one, if not one, or the highest average sales price per agent in the country. So They do. And in every region, too. Palm Beach, Connecticut, Hamptons, New York City, wherever you go, our agents are known for, you know, they do the very big deals. But we do do deal, a lot of deals. A third of our deals are done under a million dollars. And so we do a variety, but we get all the accolades for the $77 million townhouse or the, you know, we do a lot of that business because uh, we have a lot of, you know, hot shots and we're kind of a graduate school for real estate, meaning like it's not, it's a place where you come if you really want to take it seriously and where you want to up your game. Like tennis, you know, you always want to play with somebody better than you. So this is a place to come if you want to really step it up a notch. You know, it's not beginner. It, this is advanced. Yeah, I mean that's that's you guys sell some serious price point properties in in New York City and so forth. It'll be exciting to see when you when you come to Las Vegas and then you guys take over the market here. And the, and the, we're we don't get... have plans for that yet, Bo, but we'll we'll see. You never right. know. You never yeah. know what can happen. Yeah, that's right. We got a lot of East Coasters coming to Vegas, so that would be amazing. Uh, kind of rounding out the conversation here, uh, Bess. What are your top recommendations for an agent out there that really wants to maybe they're three, four years in and they're they're doing OK, but they really want to take their business seriously. I love how you said the word seriously, because if you want to be successful, you have to take anything seriously. So what, what are your tips there? Yeah, I would say um, I would encourage agents, especially if they're newer, to go and see as much property as they can. I would go to as many open houses. I'd volunteer to do them for agents, see everything. The new developments always have these openings. Go to see all of them. Be fluent with the inventory because you have to be educated. And then I would get a mentor. I would talk, make sure I'm friendly. Go into the office. Go to meetings. Go to con like do all that stuff because you want to be the smartest person in the area that you're trying to sell in. I would do that and I would always, I'd make friends with all the agents at every firm. Don't hang up the phone on people. Don't lose your temper because you need to do business with them. Be somebody when they say, oh my God, Joe Schmo, I love you. You're fantastic. They want to do a deal with you. Don't be a schmuck. Be nice to people. Take care of people. Uh, and that sort of like grows and grows and grows. And uh, little by little, you do a good job and it's like, it's like compound math. It keeps going and going. You know, and be on time. I, I do not like, I'm telling you a true story, Bo. I interviewed somebody recently for a big position. He was 20 minutes late and no offense. He was a really nice guy, but I was like, nope, not hiring him. If he can't show up on time for this, what does that say? It's an irresponsible person. And so unless you like had a serious incident, but you know, I'm, I, I you know, but I, punctuality is my pet peeve. I like on time. I agree with you 100%. I, <laughs> yeah. um, I'm like, I'm like planning my, I just like to be on time. Let, let's go early. I, I don't like, you know, that's a difficult part with my wife is, is that uh, in Mexico, where she's from, they're a little bit more lenient. Let on me the just time. tell you, Bo, I was married to a Spaniard, Sergio from Spain. And they're always Spanish time, always an hour late, always. And I, for me, the neurotic Jew from New York. I would be like sweating, schwitzing, angry, frustrated. Like we operated. No wonder we're not together anymore. But, you know, it's we still love each other. But yeah, like Spanish time is very different than neurotic Jewish time. I'm just telling you. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, Bess, this, this has been such an amazing conversation. I really appreciate it. Um, My pleasure, Bob. Where, where's the best place if somebody wanted to follow you? Can they go to your website? Where, where would you recommend? Yeah, um, they can find me on BHS or on Instagram. It's Reina de NYC. Since you're speaking Spanish, Bo, you should know what that means. Reina si, is queen. Si. You do? Reina de NYC is queen of New York. It's been my tag for a long time. Uh, or on LinkedIn, they can find me. But I'm always here to ha help. Any agents, if they have questions, can always reach out to me. Sometimes I go to schools and talk to them and they reach out and ask questions, I'm here for that. I always love to like give any advice I can share, anything I can do to help. I love it, I love it. And thank you so much for your valuable time. My pleasure. And, and uh, thanks everybody for watching this episode. 
I'm bringing on really good guests. And I have to say today's guest, I was the first time I was nervous. I don't know why I was nervous, <laughs> but I'm being honest. I was like, okay, I'm reading her bio. I'm like, oh my God, she's a, she's big time. But anyway, thank you so much. And, and you're just a joy. I hope I can meet you in person sometime. Yeah, if you get to the city, Bo, let me know. Call me up, okay? Oh, yeah, Practice, well. Tienes que practicar. Español. Sí, sí. Vámonos. Venga. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thanks so much. See, bye, see everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.